Uh, it's 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 through 20 for this morning, and I'm calling this teaching, Put Some Fight in Your Faith. As a matter of fact, I, I, I thought about that title, and I, I would actually like to add to the end of it, Put Some Fight in Your Faith, Would you? Come on now. I mean, that's the idea here. Uh, years ago, and I know I'm dating myself here, but some may remember this. Years ago, there was a gas commercial, a gas station commercial, and uh, uh, several commercials. And uh, what they showed were people that were in cars that were trying to uh, uh, get their car started, or their car was sputtering, or it would die out. And... Uh, 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 in one of the commercials, then this uh, tiger that kind of looked like Tony the Tiger, you know, uh, great. He, he would come along and he would uh, push the person's car who was stalling uh, into an Esso, Imperial Oil, Esso gas station. I don't know, anybody remember that? And, uh, and the whole, uh, 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 the whole, uh, the big line out of the commercial was, put a tiger in your tank. You remember that? And then as the car would zoom away, it would actually have a tiger's tail uh, out the back of the car as it zoomed away. Well, I, as I looked at these verses, that's our concern here today. It's like Paul the Apostle is speaking to Timothy, his protege, and he's saying to, to Timothy, and he's going to say it to us then, would you put some tiger in your tank? You know, don't take some things laying down. Stand up for your faith. Take a stand, Timothy. Now, Paul is uh, again talking to Timothy, who's been his traveling companion, as far as I can tell, for about 15 or 16 years to this point. And so, although some people see Timothy at this point as being in his 20s perhaps even in his early 20s I don't see that at all I think Timothy's in his 30s he might even be in his late 30s uh, the Jews had this uh, thing where they wouldn't actually call a man a man <laughs> you're not a man until you're 40 <laughs> and then when you're 40 then you can be called a man un hombre oh, okay uh, anyway uh, 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 so he's not quite there yet so it's not surprising then that Paul would call him young Timothy and of course, uh, Paul, this uh, first and second Timothy are Paul's very last letters that he wrote. So uh, the assignment given to Timothy, and I don't know if you could imagine this yourself, if somebody came up to you, one of the pastors came up to you, tapped you on the shoulder, says, I got a job for you. Sure thing, what would you like me to do? Well, I want you to go over this church that has false teaching, and I want you to tell them to stop it. <laughs> I want you to correct them and do it strong. Be strong about it, Timothy. And so there are some teachers who have changed the gospel. And we are those who know that if we change the gospel, which is so clearly delineated in the scriptures, which is salvation is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. It is by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ, period. It's not Jesus plus something else. It's not Jesus plus good works. It's not Jesus plus sincerity. Salvation is by grace through faith. That's it. Now, Jesus will take you wherever he finds you. And hey, I mean wherever he finds you. He'll take you. But he won't leave you where you're at. And as I look at the books of First and Second Timothy, I think that's the kind of idea that he's trying to get across to both Timothy and to the church of Ephesus, where Timothy has been left behind. Come on now, he's saying, let's go, come on. Let's wake up to the faith that God has given us. Don't stay immature. Put a tiger in your tank, would you? If we change the gospel, then it is no gospel at all. Here's what we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name, that's the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. <laughs> so you call on Jesus. You trust in him. You rely on him or you end up relying upon yourself. 
And in our daily walk with Christ, as we then begin to mature, we too, unfortunately, can drift. We too can sputter out in our faith. We too can lose power, or as we'll find the Apostle Paul is saying, be careful that you don't get shipwrecked in your faith. So let's do this. Let's pray. Let's read these few verses and see what the Lord might have for us this morning. Father, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the church family, Lord. I thank you, Father, uh, that you are here. I thank you, Lord, you've not left us. I thank you, Father, that you have purpose and plans yet to accomplish in our lives in and through us. I thank you, Father, that your word is alive. Now bring it alive to our hearts and souls, Lord. For we rely upon you, O Holy Spirit, to be the teacher this morning. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. The whole church family says. Amen. Paul the Apostle writes, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith, and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Heavy verses. You know, the book of Timothy is a heavy, heavy book. And... Uh, uh, You'll see as we continue on through, through, through this study, through this book, it, it serious matters. It serious matters to an important church that's within the Bible, and that's the book of Ephesus. We hear a lot about Ephesus. They get corrected a number of times, you know. They have a lot going on, but they have a lot that's wrong, and they got something that's wrong here. I, I think, I was thinking this week that in one sense, as we open up in particular the epistles, the letters of the Apostle Paul, what we are doing in effect is, in one sense, reading somebody else's mail. It's like I'd say, hey, let's open up Timothy's mailbox and see what's in there today. Or if I said to you, hey church, I came across this letter from a really right-on missionary writing to an associate missionary. Would you guys like me to read it to you today? That's kind of what we're doing in these letters, from, in this one in particular, from Paul to Timothy, written all those years ago. Yet, you know what? The Holy Spirit knew we would be here today. The Holy Spirit would, knew that we would be studying these verses today. And I believe, and we can know, that it was the Spirit of God having the Apostle Paul write down just what he wanted us to hear today. Here's what we read in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. This letter that we're reading today, I know we've got chapter and verse. When Timothy re read it, it was on a scroll <laughs> that he rolled out. <laughs> didn't have chapters and verses. It didn't say the Bible on the front. He was getting a letter that he really needed, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. All of the Bible you can look at as God's love letter to you. That in the counsel of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before the world began, he put things here in his word that he knew you would find. And I believe with much anticipation, as you learn and grow in the word, it is the Holy Spirit who sits and waits. Oh, are they going to get it? Oh, are they going to find what I put in there for them? <laughs> And I think the Holy Spirit just delights as the word of God just begins to light up to us. And here's what you'll also find. You'll find that what, so much of what you find in the word of God is in direct contrast to what the rest of the world might say or the rest of the world might be doing. 
There should be a distinct difference between you and those who have not had the word of God light up to them. And if there's not, then Paul the Apostle in another place in the scripture says, check yourself. Make sure you're in the faith. Make sure you're not just saying you're a Christian because you were born in the USA. <laughs> that doesn't make you a Christian, does it? Any more than what? Eating donuts makes you a cop. It just doesn't work. It just, it's not that way. <laughs> hey, it's not a joke. I did a ride along with a police officer and at the end of the day, he says to me, I want to make one more stop. And I said, great. And where did he go? Winchell's! Winchell's Donuts! And I just kind of held my breath. I didn't say anything, you know. <laughs> but I thought, this is funny. Verse 18, let's go to it. This charge, that's the word I'm going to zero in in a moment. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. That, that's what I'm translating to put a tiger in your tank or put some fight in your faith, would you? This charge I commit to you. Well, what charge is that? And that's actually found back in verses 3 and 4, and I'll just kind of summarize that for you. Uh, Paul the Apostle gives Timothy a military type of order, and that's the word that's used. I, I, this is a command. This is a charge. This is like one officer speaking to another, you know. <laughs> uh, buck up, private. Here are your orders. That's the kind of thing that Paul the Apostle is saying to him. And what he's doing here is he is reinforcing what he had told Timothy was to knock it off with the false doctrine. Don't let them pervert the gospel. Don't, don't let them add to it or take away from it. It's Christ. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's your great high priest. He's the one that you rely upon. Don't try to mix anything else in. That's what he's reinforcing to him. So I want you to check something out here that Paul does very interestingly. And I think it's something that God does to us. Is first off, it's an apostolic order. This I command you. This I charge you. And I look through the scriptures and I find in the scriptures, there are lots of places where the word of God very clearly says, do this, don't do that. Don't try this, don't go there, stay here. <laughs> you know, kind of like when you purchase something, you know, you purchase something, I don't know, hair dryer, and it says, congratulations, you have purchased the world's greatest hair dryer, right? <laughs> and then it says, do not use in the shower. <laughs> well, you could use it in the shower but only once. <laughs> so the manufacturer looks at whatever it is you purchase and says, this is how you use it. Well, God's the manufacturer. And he says, I'm commanding you, don't do this. You'll shipwreck yourself. You'll break yourself. You know, we, we don't break God's law. Now hold your breath for a second. We don't break God's law. We break ourselves upon God's law. God's law is firm. It stands. There ain't nothing you can do to change it. It's immutable. It, it, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. The Constitution. <laughs> the higher courts. But the Supreme Court said. God's not paying attention. His law is unbreakable then it becomes us who break ourselves against God's law. This I command you this day. I, I can read a lot of those in the scriptures. But look what Paul does. He says, this I charge you, son Timothy. So it's not just an apostolic order. It has fatherly love in it. And I see when God gives us a command, I read into it or I hear the voice of God as though he's speaking to Adam. Adam, Adam, in the garden. Where are you? Where have you gone, my son? And I see God speaking to us in like manner. Here's the order. My son, my daughter, 
Don't break against this. Don't fall upon this. I love you. I'm giving this to you because I love you. That's how God speaks to us. Now, the next part of this is pretty interesting. Because Paul then says to Timothy, uh, one of the reasons, Timothy, that I am saying this to you and giving you this order is because, don't you remember, Timothy, being prayed for? Don't you remember being spoken over by some loving, mature Christians that God was speaking through? Hey, haven't you had that experience where you knew when somebody was praying for you that it was no longer just them, but their prayers were from a heavenly destination they came from heaven to you have you had that happen to you i think i think you know we saw that didn't we last week at the at the baptism boy there was a lot of words free flowing there weren't they <laughs> praise god i hope they were all from jesus it sure seemed that way didn't it and sometimes when you're hit with a word from god you're hit with a prayer from god you i've seen it so many times you don't have any other uh, uh, alternative but to cry it's like okay you're speaking you're praying but i know it ain't you <laughs> timothy had this kind of an experience paul was there and paul said to timothy don't you remember the words that were prayed over you the words that were spoken over you don't you remember they were heavenly inspired those speaking so did so in a way in which to lift you up and to move you on in the things of god so the lord had spoken to timothy through others by the gift of prophecy look uh, i'm speaking prophetically right now <laughs> prophecy is simply Speaking forth the word of God. That, that's what I'm doing. The very best prophecy today is the reading of the scriptures. <laughs> they're inspired. They're alive. They're powerful. When you prophesy, you're simply speaking forth the word of God. And this is what happened to him. I think it very well could have been something about Timothy's future ministry. Timothy, I, I just really have impressed upon me that this is how God's going to use your life. You're going to be shocked and amazed as you see how God unfolds his plan for your life. Stay on target. Put a tiger in your tank in faith. Hang in there. Don't, don't, don't be moved. Don't stop. Keep going. This is, this is, you know what? This is a message I almost think we need to hear every day. When you wake up, that spiritually you'd hear the Lord say, hey, today, put some fight in your faith, would you? Because there's going to be things coming against you. Timothy, take the words that were given to you and by them, the word of God given to you, I want you to wage a good warfare. Now, this may surprise some. I hope it doesn't surprise anybody in this church family. But uh, there is a gospel out there that says, hey, when you come to Jesus and you stir a little Jesus into your life, what's going to happen is it's going to be a bed of roses. It's all going to be sweet, man. I'll tell you, in anything you want, you know, from a Cadillac to a BMW, you just claim that thing. <laughs> you just speak it into existence. You ready? Baloney! <laughs> that is not true. That is not true. Hey, once you give your life to Christ, are you ready? Welcome to the warfare. Welcome to the warfare. And I would say that some folks who say, boy, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, boy, I'm just going to, you know, all these things. I'm going to command the devil and I'm going to, you know, look, they can't, they want to exercise authority over you and over everything else, but they can't exercise authority over, I don't know, some people are saying they can't even exercise authority over a dirty sink, you know, <laughs> a sink full of dishes. <laughs> I command you be clean, you know, it's, you're going to get dirty in this world. It, it, as soon as you come into Christ, you've entered a warfare. And I don't know how many times you've heard Pastor Mike get up here and say, look, you're in a battle. What are you doing with flip-flops and gym shorts on? Right, Mike? 
<laughs> Put on your armor. There's bombs going off. There's, look, look. And for those of you who want to be used by God, guess how he uses you? On the front lines, medic. And you run in there and you lay hands on people. Be healed, be well. Let me carry you out of this. God has a plan. Don't stop. Keep breathing. Look at me. Let's go. That's how God wants to you. That's a word for some people here today, by the way. <laughs> so when Paul says you're in a warfare, when he says wage a good warfare, this is what he's saying to Timothy. This is what he's saying. You, you check the scriptures. You see if you see this too. First thing he says is to him, stay where you are. Remember Paul had his bag packed? It was at the front of the letter. It was almost as though, okay, Paul, let's go on our next missionary journey. And then Paul says, uh-uh. I want you to stay right where I put you. Some folks need to learn to stay right where God put them. Even when it's uncomfortable, even when you may not like it, grow where you're planted, people. Where God plugs you in, stay plugged in. Because the enemy and the world and your own flesh and the devil will do anything possible to blow you off course. Stay in Ephesus, Timothy. To charge the church not to teach any other doctrine. Don't teach any other gospel. No legalism. No keeping the law for salvation. Don't you let them do that there. That's what he's saying to Timothy. Warfare is not a fun thing. Contending for the faith can be difficult. It can be hard to say to a brother or sister, look, I, I don't think that's what the verses are saying. I don't think that's what the Bible's teaching. I want, you to, I want you to go through it. I want us to look at it. I want us to understand what God is doing. No matter what anybody else is telling you, no matter how hard anybody else may influence you, you stay with the gospel as purely as it's given in the word of God. There are a lot of churches deviating from that. And why do I think that's so? Because we are such a me generation. You know, we're the I generation. <laughs> we want I Bibles, <laughs> you know, with an app that takes out all the parts we don't like. <laughs> I love the word of God. It's the verses I don't like. You know, it's something like that, you know. The parts that make us uncomfortable. The parts that tell our flesh, no, 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 that's not good for you. You keep on that way and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt your heart. It's going to hurt your conscience. Don't go that way. Let's go a little deeper. Verse 19. By the way, verse 19, here's how you're going to wage warfare. Oh, okay, let's see how we wage warfare. Having faith and a good conscience. <laughs> Is that what it says? Fight the good fight, wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Again, this is in Ephesus. Ephesus was a port city. You can go to Ephesus today. It's no longer a port city <laughs> because uh, of all the, you know, it just moved inland. <laughs> all the debris and the, however that works. Some of you people that are geographically, I, I'm geographically hindered. Uh, but uh, some of you that are better at that, you, you know how cities can move inland and that's what happens here. But it was a port city. So if anybody knew about shipwrecks, it would be a port, sit, uh, a port city. By the way, by this time, Paul the Apostle himself has been shipwrecked. <laughs> so he knows what that looks like. A lot of people wondering whether they're alive or dead, whether they're going to make it, what's going to happen next. You know, everybody, every man for himself. A shipwreck's a terrible thing. So this is how we wage, first of all, with faith. I'm not going to make this complicated. I want to make it as simple as possible. Faith, what's that? Believe God. <laughs> Believe, would you please believe God? That's what he's talking about here. Acting upon the word of God with obedience to the word of God. You know, there was some, uh, Jesus said at one point, uh, in fact, you finish it for me. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
That's from your Savior who died in your place, who took your sins upon himself. If you love me, you love me? Keep my commandments. Faith in knowing that God is in control of your life. You don't need to panic, Christian. You don't need to wonder what's coming next. God who loves you already knows what's coming next and he has promised to provide for your needs. What need have you of panic, believer? When you serve the God of all creation. You know, I, 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 sometimes when I'm in a trial, which, uh, you know what that's like? <laughs> uh, I think, my, I think to myself, I want to pass this test without, without losing my faith. So you recognize you're in a trial and you go, aha, Lord, I'm in a trial. I sure would like to be able to get through this trial without freaking out, without panicking, without blaming you, without blaming my brothers, without going anywhere without do, just believing you with faith in you faith that what the maker of heaven says concerning our lives goes does what God says does that go is that what goes in your life no matter how the world may downplay the word of God, no matter how the world may disregard the Bible, to you it is gospel, believer. And warfare through having a good conscience towards God. Imagine that, having a good conscience towards God. What's the first thing Adam and Eve did when they'd blown it in the garden? They hid. They got fig leaves. <laughs> they covered themselves with something. And that's what people do today. It's no different. We react the same. We're human. We sin. Or we hear that something is a sin. Then we cover ourselves with intellectualism. Well, I'm not quite sure that that applies to the culture today, you see. Because uh, human humanity and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. It's sin! <laughs> or you hide. You know what hide means? You, be, you, you get into a double life. I know this is wrong, but nobody will see. I know that this is wrong, but this is how I do it. I know this is wrong, but I'm going to ignore. Sorry, God. Nope. Not today. There is nothing better than having a good, a clean conscience before your Lord. There is nothing worth trading it away for. There is not enough money. There are not enough worldly treasures to replace its value. To have a good conscience means... You ready? To have a good conscience before God means... That we have a greater fear of God than we have a fear of man. That what the world thinks, or what I might think, or what you might conjure up, or what anybody on the face of this planet may argue, I am going to put the greater stock in the word of God than I am in men's wisdom or what I think would better suit me at the moment. That's to have a clean, good conscience before God. Oh, but if you do that, it's going to cost you a lot of money. If you don't cheat, it's going to be expensive. If you do that, you'll lose some of your friends. Maybe you need to lose those friends. Listen to me, church family. Hell is filled with people there by ignoring God's word and in choosing instead the wisdom of men over the wisdom of God. A good conscience goes to sleep at night knowing that I have done what is right and pleasing in the sight of God and on account of that I can rest easy. 
that the peace of God and my own conscience has not been violated. I'm at peace. Now the look, the Lord has us here in these verses and the Lord has us going through these lessons with Timothy. Why? Because not all keep the faith and not all have a good conscience and not all wage a good warfare. Look at back to verse 19. Having faith and a good conscience. <laughs> Don't the, look, come on. Doesn't that sound sweet to your spirit? Faith and a good conscience. Whoo, hallelujah. <laughs> How do you want to use me, Lord? What do you want to do with my life? Which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. It surprises me, though I suppose it shouldn't, how lightly I hear some folks say, Oh, I used to go to church. Oh, I used to be in service at church. Oh, I once really read my Bible every day. I love the fellowship, but that was years and years ago. And they so lightly say that. They may regard it lightly, but here in our verses, Paul the Apostle, as we'll see, is referring to that person who is shipwrecked. You can kind of play backwards what Paul the Apostle is telling Timothy. And by playing the verses backwards in a sense, you can understand what shipwrecked people, shipwrecked believers are like. Timothy, keep the charge. Like saying, stay at your post, do what you've been called to do. The shipwrecked don't do this. Timothy, keep the sound doctrine of the word. Shipwrecked people don't do this. Timothy, take a stand. Do battle with your faith and a good conscience. The shipwrecked do not do that. You know, pastors, teachers, anyone in ministry must put the pleasing of God ahead of the pleasing of people. That's not what we're seeing today. I'm going to give it to you straight. I'm going to give it to you just like I see the word of God giving it. And if I don't, you come tell me. To throw these things out is like someone lost in the Antarctic throwing away their GPS. It is like the captain of a ship tossing overboard his map of deadly coral reefs. It is like a soldier throwing off his bulletproof vest. Now, are these folks lost? I don't think that's what Paul the Apostle is saying here. Uh, they have a rough road ahead of them, certainly. They have put themselves on a shelf for service to God, Certainly they have done that. They have ended their full rich relationship which God has wanted them to do. Let's see. Uh, and shocker, he's going to actually name the troublemakers. Verse 20. Of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander? Is that, is that amazing that he names the names of the troublemakers? I know, but I, I'm encouraged by this. And I'd like to now name the troublemakers in this church. <laughs> All right, how about initials? All right. <laughs> we don't have any, so praise God. Of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan. Wow, we. That they may learn not to blaspheme. You know, you see that delivered to Satan, and you're like me, and you go, what in the world does that mean? What in the world is Paul the Apostle talking about? Hello, Satan? Yeah, I got one for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> I knew that place was a cult. No. Uh, here's the first thing I want you to recognize. What is Paul's goal in what he is doing? Is it good or evil? Because notice what he says. 
it is that they learn not to blaspheme. <laughs> blaspheme is a strong word, isn't it? Blaspheme is a strong word. Look at Paul's definition of blasphemy. <laughs> Perverting the gospel. Not standing your post. <laughs> this is what the word of God is saying. I didn't write this. From this and other scriptures, really what it's spelling out is the putting of somebody out of the church. They're under the umbrella of the safety and the blessings of the church. They have fellowship. They have prayer. They have communion. They have accountability. They have friends that know and love and serve God. They have people right next to them whose goal it is to please God. And they're right in there in that nice warm little nest. And Paul the Apostle says, if they're going to continue that, I want you to kick them out of the nest. They're no longer in the fellowship of saints, nor the protection of the fellowship of saints. They're in whose dominion? They're in Satan's dominion. Put them out of the church. Now today, we see a lot of folks, if they leave one church, they just go down the next street and go to the next one, you know. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one after that. I've actually only had to put somebody out of the church once. <laughs> I've had that happen one time. Sorry, you cannot fellowship here. And uh, what he was doing to the saints was not right. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm glad he did. <laughs> so uh, that's what, and I hope he learned his lesson. <laughs> uh, he's putting them out of the church into Satan's domain. The benefits and the protection of the church family is no longer there. And I'm surprised that some people, in a sense, they fire themselves from church. <laughs> You know, you're not going to fire me. I quit. What are you quitting? Well, I'm quitting all this love and leaving all the people I love. And I'm, I'm quitting the study of the Bible, which is so rich. And I'm leaving the fellowship. Well, well you're firing yourself. <laughs> I don't get it. So that's why I say that. I don't get it. Uh, Timothy had a job in front of him. And it was to be brave. And it was to do the battle. It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be comfortable. It wasn't going to be carefree. He had to approach the job Paul left him to do as a soldier approaches battle. And that's what we're learning here today. And that's what God wants you to do. You got three things coming up against you when you say yes to Jesus. You got a battle. You got three enemies. The world, the course of the world. God, who's he? God, what does he have to say? You have your own flesh. Some people say, well, I really don't understand spiritual warfare. All right, let me explain to you how spiritual warfare works. You ready? Say no to the flesh. And oh, it's on. <laughs> the world, the flesh, and the devil, who is opposed to anything good, anything from God, anything that blesses anybody else. Paul said to Timothy, wage the good warfare. And he called him his son. Our father in heaven on account of our faith in Jesus Christ and the fact that there's no other way looks at you and he looks at me today and God says to us by his spirit, would you please put some fight in your faith? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today and I thank you for your love and your goodness. I thank you, Father, that you've drawn us here for the fellowship of the... Lord, I believe that the church is very much like a gas station, like the good old days. Can I check your oil of the Holy Spirit? Can I check if you've got water in your radiator? And of course, that would be living water. And I thank you, Lord, that you put the gas, the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us overcome uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. I thank you for the fellowship, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that your word would come across in this place with crystal clarity. We love you, Lord, and we want to fight the good fight. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and the whole church family says, Amen. Amen.